My name is Yaniv Segal, and I'm the acting assistant conductor of the Detroit Symphony. And on stage with me today is Avi Avital, who is our fantastic mandolin soloist for the first half. So, so um, in a little bit, I can talk about the program, but since Avi is here, and since probably um, this might be the first time you've heard a mandolin soloist play live. I thought maybe we'd start out by talking a little bit about uh, Avi, where he's from, uh, how you came to play this unique and beautiful instrument. Good evening, and thank you for, uh, uh, for coming, for being here. Uh, we started yesterday with the first concert. It's my first time in Detroit. I'm having a great time. Um, so I um, started to play the mandolin when I was eight years old. I grew up in uh, Be'er Sheva in Israel. It's a southern uh, city, um, not very big, not much to do. And the first, uh, the first time I saw a mandolin in my life was at my neighbor's apartment. I had a neighbor. Um, I had neighbors who had a kid who was uh, three years older than I and another who had a brother a year younger than I and we were a group of friends and um, this kid that was older than I started to play the mandolin and uh, it just looked like a lot of fun. He used to play uh, in this youth orchestra uh, with other kids and when I came to this age around um, you know, seven or eight where you start think what to do or your parents think for you what you would like to do after school, judo, karate, mandolin. It was the mandolin for me because of this neighbor. Um, so quite random, but something that still captured me in, in, in a way. I joined this youth mandolin orchestra in Be'er Sheva, conducted by who was my first teacher, and uh, that was actually my big window to classical music in general and to doing music. Uh, do your parents play anything? Do you have any brothers or sisters who also play instruments? I do. I have, um, I have two sisters. They, my, my older sister used to play the harp. Uh, but uh, my parents did not play an instrument. Um, it's actually, you know, a lot of my colleagues come from families that that have this in their tradition, classical music, or even musicians themselves. I see that a lot around, uh, you know, soloists that I uh, meet on tour and friends. Uh, my parents were not connected to classical music at all. They came from uh, Morocco um, in the 60s together with their big families and the musical tradition that they uh, were growing up with was not less rich, not uh, inferior, but just very different. Moroccan music, synagogue uh, music, uh, this is the kind of uh, music that was rooted in their, um, in their heritage. Um, classical music was something that they encountered in Israel. It was kind of the bon ton, the thing to do, send your kid to study classical music. That's what they saw our, their friends uh, do. And so they got it off a little bit with a mandolin. It should have been piano or violin. <laughs> I got that part mixed up, but it worked out okay. So you mentioned uh, this youth orchestra, youth mandolin orchestra. We have, of course, youth orchestras in, in the States. We've got bands, we've got uh, chamber music groups. But as far as I know, we don't have very many youth mandolin groups. Uh, we don't, I don't think we have even guitar ensembles. So is this something that is maybe a little bit more commonplace in the tradition in Israel? Uh, yes and no. I mean, this is the, the, a mandolin group, a mandolin orchestra. Uh, when we say mandolin orchestra, it's usually kind of the same format of a, a string orchestra translated into the mandolin family. So you would have mandolin one, usually the, most, the more advanced player, mandolin two, a little bit less advanced. Mandola, which has the range of a viola. Mandocello, which has the range of the cello. And usually a double bass. Uh, or sometimes a mando bass, which is this huge mandolin that you kind of hold on the, sits on the floor and you play like this. This is a mandolin orchestra. And it was extremely popular in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, as kind of a social club, really. 
you, can, you should imagine that at the time, if you liked a piece of classical music or a nice uh, aria from a Verdi opera or Rossini opera and you wanted to hear it again, um, you obviously could not uh, go on YouTube and stream it. You had to wait, either to wait until the opera came back to your town four years later, or you had to play it yourself. And uh, to play it we together with other uh, players, obviously something social that you would do after work for fun, in, on an amateur level. And the mandolin was just the perfect amateur uh, instrument for that. It covered, again, the whole range, but unlike the violin, it's not an instrument that you kind of have to practice every day for hours, for years, until you have an acceptable sound in order to play something together with other people. Don't get me wrong, what we'll play tonight is extremely difficult and virtuosic. But you, you won't realize. From, <laughs> but from, uh, let's say, from the moment you hold for the first time a mandolin in your hand until you can play something together with other people and it would sound roughly nice, it's pretty quick, much quicker than uh, any bow instrument. So that made the mandolin, together with the dimension of it, with the fact that it doesn't have uh, intonation, it has frets, so it immediately sounds in tune in a way when you play in an orchestra. It's, it was mass manufactured, so it was much, much, much cheaper than, uh, than violin or cello or any other instrument. Made it the perfect amateur instrument, the perfect historically, the perfect uh, kind of educational uh, vehicle for young people or for uh, amateurs. Uh, in the beginning of 20th century, Almost every town in Italy had a mandolin orchestra that traveled throughout uh, uh, Europe, um, all over Europe, uh, even in Russia. Then with the Italian immigration, you find it also in the States and in South America. Practically everywhere I play, from Alaska to Patagonia to Australia, there's always a group of three, four people coming backstage and saying, we're from the local mandolin orchestra. <laughs> I swear. And, uh, <laughs> And it, in some countries, in some areas, it was more popular than others. Just to illustrate, uh, in Milano, where I used to live for eight years, there are two mandolin orchestras now. Uh, they're all quite old, and uh, um, you know there are about 15 players in each one of the ensembles. In Japan, in Tokyo, there are 123 mandolin orchestras. <laughs> So, because in, somehow in Japan it became a tradition to have in every college and almost every high school uh, a mandolin orchestra for that exactly reason. It's like a choir or brass band that you have a lot in the States. Um, in countries like Turkey and Macedonia, it was uh, a part of the uh, education uh, program. And in Israel, where I grew up, it used to be connected to the kibbutz, from the 30s till the 70s of the 20th century, almost every kibbutz had a mandolin orchestra. Again, it was a platform to meet, to be, to socialize with your, uh, with your cohabitants, with your community. Uh, everyone had shared this equal um, voice in such orchestra, and you know, it's the after-work cultural education to do. Uh, in, from the 70s, uh, it became, it was uh, introduced into some, um, some of the, not the major cities in Israel, but some uh, uh, kind of not the privileged cities in Israel, some uh, cities in the province that had a, um, um, that had a little bit more of an immigration and integration issues that proved to be a very um, good educational vehicle for kids. Uh, and this is how my orchestra was actually practically uh, uh, funded. So um, let's talk a little bit. You mentioned the orchestras playing arrangements and so forth. There's not so much original music written for the instrument. In the orchestral repertoire, I can think of Mahler, who uses it once. Uh, I think maybe in the Godfather films, we hear a lot of mandolin. Uh, so. Okay, today you're playing two concertos. One is several hundred years old, and one is all of one year old. So uh, where, where, does the, where does the repertoire fall here? Yeah, so 
again, because the mandolin already in, the, in its birth uh, in the 18th century was considered, uh, was not considered by most of the composers as a concert instrument, uh, but more of a salon instrument. Um, a lot of composers didn't really write music for it. Or well, let's say, a lot of the composers that we know today that survived, they remained the test of time. Uh, a part of many compositions that were written in a, in an, for, again, for amateurs in a very basic level. Uh, but the, the, the big names, uh, there are not so many. I mean, there is um, um, two little pieces by uh, Mozart for uh, accompanying a singer. One of them, the most famous, is this canzonetta from Don Giovanni, the opera, which is the best part of the opera. <laughs> no, right? Yes, absolutely. It's not just me. And uh, Beethoven wrote four little pieces for the mandolin. Not a lot of people know. But he actually himself never intended them to be published. He wrote them for a young Contess, Contess Josephine Clary. She was the daughter of a sponsoring family from Prague that he used to visit. And he, at a certain point, fell madly in love with her and wrote her these four little um, sonatinas with a dedication and everything. And she played the mandolin, yeah. And, uh, and Vivaldi, of which uh, I'll play one of the concerto, one of the two concerti that Vivaldi wrote. And until today, it's interesting that Vivaldi is the most, like when you say mandolin and classical mandolin, you immediately think of Vivaldi. It's the composer mostly associated with mandolin repertoire. It's a sweet concerto. Um, um, as I said, he wrote two of them, but for the bassoon, he wrote 36. <laughs> yeah for violin 500. So this is, this is more or less the ratio. And it's too, too above the average for his time. Uh, he also wrote 90 operas. But uh, uh, now, the, the range of the mandolin, the fingering, is the same as the violin. Uh, the violin has four strings. The mandolin has each of those same four string pitches, but they're doubled. Um, and they're, are they made of steel? Uh, or woven or? Yeah, yeah, they are made um, of steel today. So how about those other couple hundred Vivaldi violin concertos? Can you transcribe some of those and perform some of those? Do they work on the instrument? Yeah, so really most of my life I played arrangements of, of music that was written uh, for other instruments, uh, partly because really there, there was not enough repertoire to f <laughs> feel a career with uh, you know, six, 16 <laughs> two, uh, two minutes of music. And, a, and, a <laughs> and, uh, and, and second of all, because of the, for the musical formation that I had, had also a little bit of a strange course. My teacher, the one I mentioned before that conducted this uh, mandolin orchestra in Beersheba, was not a mandolin player at all. He was a violinist. Uh, he came to Beersheba in the 70s from St. Petersburg. He was searching for a job as uh, a violin professor because he was a violin uh, professor, and uh, uh, but in the local conservatory where I uh, learned, they told him that they already had one. But there are these 30 mandolins in the basement. We don't know what to do with them. If you want, you can start an orchestra. That's how it started, uh, and that was my greatest luck because he was not a mandolin player. Uh, he really taught us music, and he really. Like, we were sitting with mandolins in the class, but he, in his mind, it was a violin. It was, in other words, unconditioned by the image that the mandolin had as a folk instrument, as an amateur instrument. He was talking with us, the students, about phrasing and about colors and about things that usually a mandolin uh, um, teacher would not uh, get to speak with, at least not at that time or... Um, at that area, but he was really visioning, um, you know, uh, us playing the same at the same level as if we were um, violin students. So the same kind of uh, uh, yeah level that we had to arrive arrive to. Also, he he had no clue about original repertoire for the mandolin. Uh, all he knew is the repertoire uh, for violin and uh, and uh, and what is kind of the stages that you have to go through in your musical formation, and that's what he taught us. Again, because the mandolin is tuned like the violin, uh, as Yaniv mentioned, it's pretty much transcribed 
a ball. I mean, the music that I always had uh, in front of me, the six sonatas and partitas by Bach, the concerto by Mendelssohn for violin, Rondo Capriccioso by Saint-Saëns, all this must play um, violin repertoire that every music, every violin student plays. We also, play, I and my colleagues of the same class, we also play. That made us develop a technique that had to uh, cope with these kind of technical challenges. It was some kind of a bubble, yeah, in Be'er Sheva, we really achieved the technique that, oops, oh my God. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, hasn't happened before. Yeah, and um, and also um, where were I? <laughs> <laughs> Inspiring uh, uh, Sheva, fireworks. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the exactly. bubble, the bubble burst. With the bubble, the bubble burst. Yeah, and uh, anyway, we developed, and even the mandolin. Uh, that was in the market uh, back then was not enough for the kind of repertoire that our teacher introduced. We had the luck to have encountered uh, a really a genius uh, mandolin maker who had the same scope. He wanted also to redefine the mandolin to make it a concert instrument, to make it as loud as the violin, as colorful as the cello. Uh, and uh, this, this person's name is Arik Kerman, is the mandolins that I've been using for the last 25 years, very much together in the co collaboration, keep developing, keep improving the instrument. I'll give you a really funny fact, because this Arik Kerman, who is today 82 years old, was studying mandolin uh, making with Yaniv's grandfather in Israel. They were cousins, kind of. Okay, so um, I, I want to make sure that Avi has some time to, to go backstage and, and warm up. So just one quick question, if you will. Okay, so we have a Vivaldi concerto that you're playing, and then uh, actually preceded by uh, a concerto by a, a living composer by the name of Anna Klein. She's uh, about 30, in her late 30s, a British composer who trained in America. Um, could you tell us a little bit about maybe just briefly about the genesis, but also kind of what to expect or what we're going to listen for in this piece. Yeah, so the piece was commissioned uh, in 2017 for uh, a, um, a big music festival in Germany. I had a, I was artist in residence, and one of the many projects I did there was to, uh, new music. This is something that has been very close to my heart in the last 20 years. I've been, I premiered a hundred pieces. Uh, written for me for the mandolin in order to kind of in my vision to create um, a, a high quality repertoire uh, for you know future mandolinists to come and just to correct this historical gap where no none of the composers wrote ever for the mandolin uh, anyway so this is uh, something um, uh, the Anna Klein concerto is something that I was very proud of because it's already it was the beginning of like working with a a certain caliber of uh, composers. Uh, she's doing quite well. She's quite popular in the world, and uh, her piece is, is just amazing. Um, she confessed to me that it was hard for her. It was challenging for her to write a mandolin concerto. It wasn't a surprise for me because many of these composers I worked with in the past had the same challenge. Um, when you write something for the piano or uh, the flute or the violin, you come you scan the tradition. Uh, you kind of, you see what Mozart wrote and what Chopin wrote and what Rachmaninoff wrote and what Prokofiev wrote and then based on this you can kind of um, uh, write your composition. Um, in a way it's, uh, it's, a, it's frightening for a lot of composers to write a piano concerto in the 21st century. Uh, in the other hand, um, with the mandolin, writing for the mandolin was really from scratch. She didn't have a lot of um, 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 other um, compositions to look and to learn from and to get ideas from. Uh, and, uh, and that's the fascinating part for me because every piece that I, that I commission, that I, uh, that I play, uh, for the first time it's, it really teaches me also something that I maybe didn't see about the mandolin. The mandolin is full of associations. You know, for some of us it's it reminds Italian movies. 
for others. It's bluegrass here in America, it's uh, Brazilian music, it can be Middle Eastern music, it can be so many things. Uh, there is, it's very, there are some bits that uh, in this piece uh, that is very um, Slavic. That you, you, it's almost like I feel like I play the, the, I imitate the balalaika in some bits of this piece that you will hear. Um, that's mostly in the last movement, the, the strumming, chaka chaka jump, chaka jump, jump, chaka jump, exactly. that kind of rhythm. Yeah. So it was fascinating to see how Anna Klein saw the Mandarin, what kind of associations she had with it. Uh, in the program notes, you will read a little bit about the process of her writing the piece in, in some remote retreat that, uh, uh, in her belief, was haunted by ghosts. And that influenced, really, the playing. And in fact, there are some, some beats are really kind of Tim Burton film-like, <laughs> uh, which, uh, which is very fun. Uh, yeah, and in general, the, the piece is very, I mean, the structure of it is called Three Sisters. It has three movements, one, two, and three. Three sisters, meaning they're from the same family, but each one of them is different. It's actually named after a chain of uh, mountains in the Rocky Mountains. Um, so it has this duality kind of association both with nature, with these mountains that, again, they're the same family, but each one of them has a different character is very naturalistic piece and uh, and three sisters literally three sisters you can imagine from the same family and how what's what's the similarities between them and how each of them is different well thank you so much for for uh, spending some time with us and telling us a little about the mandolin and we look forward to hearing you in just a little while thank you very much enjoy the show So I've got a, a few more minutes uh, to, to talk about the program and also to take any questions if you may have them. The rest of the program, other than Anna Klein's uh, concerto, is by this relatively unknown composer, Vivaldi, <laughs> who about 100 years ago was completely unknown, uh, similar to other composers that we now you know, is a household name like Bach. Uh, that was not the case. Um, Vivaldi in his day, in his earlier years, was known as an opera composer primarily. Uh, he worked at a school, an orphanage, um, where the girls in the orphanage formed an orchestra, and so he was their music teacher. And so the reason why he has one million violin concertos is because he kept on writing new ones uh, to uh, entertain himself and also to create kind of new ideas for, for the students. Um, you have to imagine there's a little bit of sadness in the, in the orchestra because uh, being a musician was not a real viable career, but it certainly was not a viable career if you were a woman. So all of those girls would not play violin after they left the orphanage when they turned 18. So it's a little bit sad, uh, tinged. Um, and uh, I think Vivaldi might be a little bit underrated, even though of course we know him as the composer of The Four Seasons and The Most Amazing Gloria, which we'll hear on the second half tonight. But he really helped to codify the modern concerto. And on today's program, we have two early, and excluding the mandolin concerto, we have two other early concerto prototypes. The, the piece that opens the program is a concerto for strings. Uh, and so just, it's called concerto, but there's no soloist. It's the whole orchestra. Uh, that concept did, actually disappeared for a number of years until the 20th century when composers such as Bartok then wrote concerto for orchestra but here you have a concerto for string orchestra. And then opening the second half is a concerto grosso, which is uh, for three soloists. In this case will be the, the concertmaster, associate uh, principal first, and principal cello, taking on the main voices as a soloist in dialogue together with the orchestra. And so this kind of dialogue between soloist and orchestra 
is what turns into a concerto later on. You can think about lots of concertos starting with a big orchestral exposition showing off the material, and then the soloist comes in with that same material, but is more flashy, develops it, and takes it to new soaring heights. Uh, Vivaldi um, uses the three movement structure of a first movement that's fast, a slow second movement, and then another exciting last movement. Uh, so he's very important in the development of, of concertos, of uh, very flashy writing for the string instruments. He was himself a violinist, so some of the techniques uh, that he uses, the rapid switching of strings, uh, the repeated notes, these would have been very exciting in his day. Uh, and of course, some of his concertos now are used as teaching concertos, like as Avi was mentioning, there's kind of a progression of works that every violinist will go through, and it usually will include a Vivaldi concerto, probably one of the ones he wrote for his student. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the Four Seasons, that's really, those are really, really challenging. And so that probably would have been for himself playing the violin. He um, did not die a very well-known person. He kind of fell out of fashion in Venice, where he was from, and he went to uh, Vienna to try his luck there, uh, and then the emperor whom he sought to court or uh, establish himself as a composer died, and then within a year, Vivaldi himself died in Vienna. Uh, so, it's luckily we have his music because he mailed copies to some different places around Europe. And so years later, uh, these manuscripts were found. And in the early 1900s, there was a movement towards uh, rediscovering and recognizing his contribution influence on the concerto, on people like Bach. Uh, of course, Bach transcribed several of Vivaldi's works. And you can see his direct influence on, say, his Brandenburg Concerto Number no. 5, uh, or, or the style in general. And Bach would have actually seen Vivaldi's works, which is very unusual, because at the time, and it still is going on in Leipzig, there is a renowned book fair, a book festival, and everything printed would have gone through there, including sheet music. And it's very close to the St. Thomas where uh, Bach was the music director for so many years, and so he would have just gone down the street to the book fair and seen all the latest trends and fashions and musical ideas. And so you can definitely trace the path from Vivaldi to Bach. Oh gosh, I have like one minute left before I have to get off the stage so that musicians can come on to warm up. So if there are any questions, maybe I could take, a, take one or two. Yes, no, maybe? About the mandolin. I can talk about the mandolin, too. <laughs> I have a mandolin at home, actually. As, as Avi mentioned, my grandfather was a builder of the instruments, and my father's a violin maker, and my father also plays the mandolin, and when he was younger, he used to teach mandolin lessons as well in, in Israel. So for me, it's really wonderful to see this instrument, which I heard growing up, um, now at the forefront of, of the stage. I don't think you hear anybody play it quite like Avi does. He can move so fast, every note is clear. Uh, the instrument itself has developed quite a bit, um, and so you'll definitely hear that as well. And I should mention, one, the, the one last thing is that we also have three other fantastic soloists with us tonight. Because uh, in, in the Gloria, there are three singers and a chorus. Uh, so, it's, it's a real treat led by the renowned conductor Nicholas McGeegan, who is a fantastic musician, a wonderful person, uh, specializing in classical and Baroque period music. So, while this is not a period orchestra, so you're still getting modern instruments and modern sounds, it's got that flair and color, which I think will make you love tonight's program. So, I hope you enjoy it, and thank you so much for coming.